Good morning. A couple of ground rules which you have already, I'm sure, picked up if you uh, have been here for a second or two, and that is uh, this is one of our ethics conferences, so we'll insist that you use the microphones when you ask your questions. One, two, uh, we welcome back our former interns, our soon to be, our now R2s, uh, and we're excited to have them here. Uh, our new interns are, are hot, they're excited, they're just rolling right along uh, at all levels within the institution. Um, and in the midst of all that, I get to move my office from one place to another, so it's, there's no chaos in my life at all. Uh, Maureen Kelly is going to be the moderator for our session today. She's uh, a member of the Truman Katz Center for Pi Pediatric Bioethics and an assistant professor. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, whether children should be told their, um, their diagnosis. We're going to focus on a case involving HIV. So as a reminder, we're not going to be covering um, the case in great detail. We're using this as a teaching case, so while it was based on an actual case, we've changed the details for the purposes of a broader discussion on the ethical issues. Um, we wanted to, again, um, thank Jeff Sconiers and Deborah Godfrey for continuing to support this series. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and introduce both speakers. We're going to have Ann Melvin um, from Infectious Disease present the case. Um, Anne is an associate professor of pediatric ID at University of Washington. Um, she received her MD and MPH from Tulane University. Uh, she did her internship at UCSF and then wisely transferred to the University of Washington, uh, where she joined the faculty here in 1993. Um, she provides primary care services for HIV-infected children and adolescents, as well as HIV-exposed infants. Um, her research focuses on clinical trials in HIV-infected exposed children to prevent perinatal HIV transmission and to investigate optimal management strategies for the long-term health of these children. Um, she's also involved in international research on HIV. Um, she's co-chair of an international trial looking at different treatment strategies for HIV-1 infected children, and she's worked in Chennai and uh, rural India. Uh, she's also co-chair of the um, Bioethics and Regulatory Core for the Institute for Translational Sciences, which is how Ben and I know her intimately. She does a lot of work for us on that group. Um, commenting on Dr. Melvin's case, we're really pleased to have Dr. Alan Fleshman, uh, Senior Vice President and Medical Director of the March of Dimes Foundation. He's also Chair of the Federal Advisory Committee to the National Children's Study at um, NIH. Uh, he's clinical professor of pediatrics and clinical professor of epidemiology and population health at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Um, he's a native New Yorker and graduated from the City College of New York and from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, he did his pediatrics training at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, he, w he completed a fellowship in perinatal physiology at the National Institutes for Health and Oxford University. He joined the faculty at Albert Einstein in 1975, where he became professor of pediatrics, professor of epidemiology and social medicine, and served as director of division of neonatology until 1994. Um, in 1994, he became president, vice president of the New York Academy of Medicine, where he catalyzed the academy's growth into research intensive institution in areas of urban health, medical education, public policy, bioethics, and public health. He's published extensively in many areas of perinatal medicine and has been a pioneer in developing in the developing field of bioethics, emphasizing the rights of individual patients and the responsibilities of healthcare professionals and organizations. Uh, his work has resulted in over 140 publications in peer-reviewed journals and chapters, including a book edited with Robert Cassidy entitled Pediatric Ethics from Principles to Practice. We're very pleased to have him here. So we'll start with Anne, who will present the case. You can use this, or you can advance it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure. So my case is a 12-year-old boy that I, <clears throat> boy that I take care of in clinic. He um, was African-born. They immigrated here when he was about five. He was diagnosed at age five when they moved here. His father knew he was infected, that he himself was infected. The mother knew, but the boy had not been tested. Both parents are, were doing well, and it turns out he has one younger uninfected sibling. 
it, his initial course was mostly that he had poor growth and chronic diarrhea, but otherwise he had no hospitalizations and no really significant illnesses. And after he moved here and got diagnosed, he started antiretroviral therapy at about age six. He lives with his parents and his younger sibling. He's currently doing very well in a regular seventh grade class. He has some requirements for extra tutoring in math, but he's otherwise a fairly normal child. He's very outgoing and social, runs track, asks lots of questions. His parents both work, and no one in the immediate family, they don't have any other immediate family in the area, but the family is well integrated in their own ethnic community. He comes to our clinic, which we call the Seattle Children's Hospital Virology Clinic, about every three to four months for his HIV care. And in the clinic, it's pretty much a regular clinic like we have with the medical group there, so there's no significant interaction with other families and other children. He's been on antiretroviral therapy with zidovudine, lamivudine, and efavirenz. His CD4 counts normal for age. His HIV PCR is undetectable, so he's very adherent to his medications. He remains small, and he has some mild lipoatrophy, but he otherwise he would, be con he would be considered by anyone seeing him completely healthy, and he considers himself completely healthy. The status of HIV now in the world, there are a lot of children in the world living with HIV. The latest UNAIDS estimate is about two million children. It's really difficult to get statistics in the United States because they only accept data from states that have name reporting and only 34 states do name reporting. Plus it's difficult to distinguish HIV only from AIDS. And so the estimate is that currently in the US there are less, there are about 4,000 children less than 15 years living with HIV AIDS in the US and maybe about 7,000 adolescents, but I don't think those statistics are quite correct. When I first started this, the average lifespan for a child with HIV was five to six years, and none of the children in our clinic lived beyond their early teens, I would say. Um, now, with good care and antiretroviral therapy, um, we don't know. The estimates in adults are 24 to 35 years once they start antiretroviral therapy. Um, we have no idea how long these kids will live, but we're anticipating that they'll live clear, well into adulthood. However, it does take rigid adherence to lifelong medications. Um, and a lot of our patients ask, you know, is there ever going to be a cure? And we always say that, yes, we certainly hope so, but at this point in time, the best they can do is to take care of themselves now to be available for that when it comes. So going back to our patient, one of the issues that we deal with a lot in clinic is his parents don't want him to know that he has HIV. Their rationale is that they don't think he'd understand, and they're really afraid that he'll tell others. In fact, when this family first came to clinic, they wouldn't allow us to use an interpreter, even though the mother didn't speak English, because there were, there's enough interaction within their ethnic community that they didn't want anyone to have the chance to know that their family had HIV. And that's really the biggest concern they have is the social stigma and the fact that he's a pretty disinhibited, very active and chattery child, and they're worried that he will tell other people. We've had multiple discussions with the parents regarding this issue, but have respected their wishes, and we deal with him as a, on, the, as, on the daily basis with what he does and why he does it, but not with, without discussing the fact that he actually has HIV. So one of the issues that came up recently is that we, um, our research um, clinic, we have access to clinical trials, and we offer those to our children and our families. And there was a study that he was um, eligible for. It was a relatively straightforward study looking at one to two doses of routine vaccines to see whether or not they provided better coverage in HIV-infected children. In spite of the fact that with antiretroviral therapy, children's CD4 counts normalize. When you do um, more sophisticated immunologic testing, these, their immune systems are not normal. And even with care, most of, the, most of the time we're finding that they need more than the usual routine vaccine. So this was to look at whether one versus two doses of, of um, it was men the meningococcal vaccine would improve their response. So they were randomized to one dose or two doses if they were, met the eligibility criteria. So for, for the child, it involved two extra clinic visits with blood draws that were specifically related to study some additional blood taken at routine visits, and the possibility, if they randomized to it, to one additional vaccine. They were going to get one vaccine anyway for standard of care. The IRB has determined that the study is greater than minimal risk with the prospect of direct benefit, and that means that they require assent. 
So it was one parent consent. A parent could say, yes, they want their child to participate. Ages 7 to 14, the child had to sign a written assent form that was simplified, and then over 14, they would sign a standard consent form. So this is our basic case, and Maureen's going to talk about the questions that came up. So there are a number of questions that came up that you might be thinking about um, as Dr. Fleshman is talking. Um, is there an ethical obligation to inform children with a serious disease about their diagnosis? And how might we dif differentiate between different diseases or different diagnoses? So HIV, CF, um, the most familiar model is cancer disclosure, autism, schizophrenia. Um, and then what role should the family's wishes play? So in this case, the family's wishes were really driving the case. Um, the social context, the cultural beliefs in involved or sur surrounding disclosure, particularly with a disease like HIV. Are there circumstances in which we should override those parental wishes or cultural beliefs? Um, and then in the research context, uh, we'll talk about both the clinical context and the research context. Um, if assent is required for the child to enroll in a trial, um, does this undermine the whole process of assent and agreement to participate in the trial? Um, can he enroll without being informed of his diagnosis, but perhaps being informed <coughs> of other information? So, Dr. Fleshman, you want to come on up? Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Maureen. I want to thank Dr. Melvin and Dr. Wilfon for inviting me um, here this morning. But I really have to ask, are there any interns in the room, first years? I got to tell you that I remember my first week of internship. <laughs> And I was just thinking how long ago that is. And I remember it quite distinctly, and I am very impressed that you're sitting here, <laughs> particularly at the ethics section. You know, it's not like taking care of the critically ill child in the intensive care unit, or worse, the neonatal unit. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about disclosure, um, an issue that I've thought a good deal about over the years. And I hope this will set a tone for you of integrating concerns for children and family-centered care in a process of understanding how we respect children and yet integrate the needs of their families and of our communities uh, in these conversations. Um, let me start um, by a little bit of history, because I think putting this in the historical context is helpful. For adults in the United States, and this historical context is very different internationally as any of us who have traveled or worked in other countries understand. So I'm going to focus primarily on the U.S. During the conversation period, if we want to talk about international issues, I'd be happy to address some of those. We start in the U.S. in the early 20th century with cases actually involving informed consent for clinical care, not research at all. Um, and the argument that you have to tell people why you're operating on them. You pro probably should get their permission. But that was kind of a secondary issue until some lawsuits said that if the patient said after the surgery that they didn't give permission, the surgeon was in some trouble if there was an untoward event. So, it also argues in the beginning of the 20th century you need capacity to give consent, that is to say the patient needs to understand the options, what the questions are, and the alternatives, and give a, an informed consent. You need some capacity to do that, and you need some information, and the information obligation came from the clinician. And the first half of the 20th century, physicians were the arbiters of the disclosure. How much was the right amount? In the second half of the 20th century, for adults, post-World War II, informing patients and the whole rights movement of the 60s and 70s argued that patients had a right to understand their own health and interests. Now, this seems quite self-evident today, but these were actually quite complex arguments uh, in the second half of the 20th century as the patients' rights and autonomy movements began. In the 21st century, I think it is very clear for the adult population, that adults really are empowered with lots of evidence today, both on the internet and in other ways, and we are obligated to disclose information to them, and we're obligated to respect their autonomous right to choose. But there are still several debates in the adult population. That is, 
having taught medical students and residents that autonomy is important, the question is, are physicians supposed to make recommendations to their patients, or are they just supposed to lay out a menu of options and allow patients to choose from the menu? Um, this ethicist believes that physicians have an obligation to enter into this conversation, make recommendations, and use their best judgments without being overbearing or um, paternalistic, as the ethics term puts it. But there are many physicians who are not engaging in those dilemmas, and I think to the detriment of their patients. And then there's the question about debates about disclosure of the, to the elderly. Are the elderly able to cope with these things? And then there are cultural norms in which there are some cultures, particularly in some of the Asian cultures, in which the patient is not told, but the family is told. And in those cultures, how do we deal with life and death decisions for individual patients who are adults when the family um, and the patient actually doesn't wish uh, for there to be divulging of information? Now, the disclosure questions in children parallel this work in, in adults, but it's a little bit different. We start post-World War II considering that children need to be protected. They need to be protected from the knowledge of their disease and their prognosis. Uh, those of us who got into this business a little bit after that <coughs> understand that there wasn't a lot we were doing that was positive for many of the fatal diseases in um, pediatrics. So whether we were talking about nephrology or whether we were talking about cancer, um, we really had fatal diseases that we were dealing with and there was a feeling of obligation of protection. Um, the justification was that you would only increase anxieties, uh, fears, they, children would not be able to cope, and the children didn't have the capacity to understand. Now as a parent and grandparent, I, I just, that's not intuitively obvious at all to me. Um, that children, even as young as two or three, understand most of what we do from their own perspective of how it impacts on them. Um, and I think we'll, we'll hear that, that tone as we go through some of this discussion. But there was a concept here that children didn't have this capacity and that they rarely indicate interest. Now here's where I'm going to argue that the children are smarter than we are. Um, and that we must maintain an atmosphere of optimism and hope. And then the 70s has a contextual change. The hematologist oncologists come back from meetings in the early 70s. They learn that acute lymphoblastic leukemia is now curable. And in fact, we need to aggressively treat this disease rather than hold the hands of the children and the family while they die. Um, and we are going to impose lots of problems for the children. That is to say, these toxins that we call uh, drugs <coughs> are going to create all kinds of problems with the hope that we will in fact um, save the lives of these children. And the whole context now switches to a non, to a potentially fatal disease, but with a potential for cure. And we're now talking about the trajectory of life and death in cancer. So there's a new openness to disclosure. It parallels the adult openness. And there are decisions about disclosure um, that are given to children, but physicians and parents decide, and most of the time they decide to limit the disclosure. I can tell you in 1970, as an intern at a large hospital in Baltimore, which we can remain anonymous, um, um, I was admitted on a Thursday, a 14-year-old who had been in her pediatrician's office for a camp physical. And basically, he had found a white count of 80,000 had sent this young lady to the Harriet Lane home at the Johns Hopkins, um, where we rapidly made the diagnosis of leukemia, admitted the child, and then began the workup as was appropriate in 1970. I was the intern on the adolescent unit who was told not to tell her the name of her diagnosis. And I figured, you know, what do I know? So I, you know, that's what I did. Um, so on the third day, as I went into her room at 6 in the morning to draw her bloods, we drew their bloods. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend it, but it, you know, that was the reality. 
So at 6 in the morning when I bounced into her room, as I was always bright and cheery in the morning, um, she said, Dr. Fleischman, I have leukemia, right? And I said, sure, but that's the same thing like those bad cells we've been talking about. And I drew the blood and ran to find the senior resident. Um, and, you know, clearly this young lady was a lot smarter than we were. Um, we also learned in the 70s that science doesn't, uh, silence doesn't alleviate anxiety and can isolate children. And that the uninformed child may actually have signs of depression. And you can go through the literature, particularly the oncologic literature, and you can see these studies. Um, in the 1980s, a new aspect to disclosure came out. And that was with the National Commission report on research involving children and the federal regulations, which became codified in 1981, um, assent becomes part of the consent process in pediatric research. And there's a lot of conversation about the importance to involve the children as part of the process of allowing them to be part of research. And three research studies come out um, about this psychological capacity of children to deal with these complex issues. And I think we begin to understand that the children are much more complex than we were willing to give them credit for, and that they actually understand lots about rights, information, and can process information. And that children at age 14 can provide meaningful consent equal to the ability of a 24, 34, or 44-year-old adult. Now, that doesn't mean that 24, 34, or 44-year-old adults make perfect judgments. But it means that 14-year-olds can do just as good a job. It's very interesting because it doesn't um, involve our own biases. And we think about now the decisional capacity as a developmental trajectory. And that it does start in very young children having some understanding from their own perspective about their illness. And respect for children argues that we should at least involve them and inform them as early as two and three years old in their care, even if they can't make judgments about their decisions about their care, they should be involved in a meaningful way of informing them very early on. And of course, in institutions like this children's hospital, we have whole programs of helping families deal with the children who come in for simple surgeries in the first couple years of life. We have programs of helping children understand how they're going to get tubes in their ears or how they're going to do the simple kinds of surgeries, never mind the more complex issues, which we all understand children need orientation and help in coping. But by the time you get between 11 and 14, certainly children are developing the capacity to make health decisions. And the developmental psychologists confirm that for us with investigations. And from 14 to 18, as I've alluded to, they actually have the ability to make reasoned judgments. Now, any of you who have been an adolescent or have had one as a child understand that you sometimes think they're not as reasoned as you'd like them to be. Um, but in fact, particularly for children with chronic illness or disabling conditions or a lot of experience in the healthcare system, they actually have lots of ability to, to participate in decision making at a reasonably high quality. And those of us who have dealt with those kinds of children, I think, respect children as important parts of decision making and knowledgeable. So we go on to the 1980s, and there's a whole new paradigm now in pediatrics. There's a shift from disclosure around cancer and dying from a serious individual illness to a new consideration concerning a social problem that is also an individual illness, HIV and AIDS. And in the epicenter of this um, disease, in Miami, in Newark, and in New York, um, for pediatric AIDS, lots of conversation starts to occur about how do we deal with children with this problem, and how do we disclose this diagnosis in the context of a social situation which is stigmatizing, isolating, and dangerous for families and for children. During that time, I had the pleasure 
of being on the first AIDS committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as on the bioethics committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we put those two committees together to think very deeply about this issue. And it only took us 12 years to publish the article in pediatrics. And those of you who've worked on Acad uh, Academy of Pediatrics committees understand that that was actually quite fast. Um, <laughs> But if you look in the early 90s at the work of Michael Lipson, Michael was a psychologist at Harlem Hospital who had been hired as part of the clinical program in the HIV program. And he had an extraordinary amount of experience in helping families with this disease when children were all dying from perinatally acquired HIV in the late 80s and early 90s. And Dr. Melvin has told you that that was the experience throughout the country. <clears throat> and Michael dealt with this as a psychologist in a very large program at Harlem Hospital in New York. And his contribution here, I think, was very important. In an article in the Hastings Center Report, a journal of bioethics, not a journal of psychology, not a journal of virology, but a journal of bioethics, in which he crafts his argument around the ethical dilemma and the value concerns in disclosure. And he points out some very important things. One, disclosure is a process, not a moment. It's a very important concept. When well-intentioned clinicians, both doctors and nurses, feel an obligation based on their respect for the child and their advocacy for the child, they feel obligated to tell the child about his illness. It's a good intention, and it's a good feeling of obligation. But it's not a moment in time, and it doesn't require us to tell the child everything at once. And Lipson makes that case. He also places this disclosure in the societal and cultural and social context of the late 80s and early 90s. And the real stigmatization of this diagnosis, the concerns that the child will be both isolated and quite uh, discriminated against in his community. And we had, in the Bronx where I was, case after case of families thrown out of apartments and made homeless because of the diagnosis being disclosed in their communities. Um, this was not an unusual event. This was a usual event. Uh, and the children not allowed to go to school because of the inability of the schools to deal with the problems um, which were quite simple to deal with uh, of a child with this, with this disease. Um, <clears throat> and that disclosure is affected by the consequences to the individual child and to the family had to be considered. So Lipson talks a lot about parental attitudes and he has a lot of insight. And he starts from where the parents are. And think for a moment about being the parent of a child with perinatally transmitted HIV. It's different from cancer. It's even somewhat different from cystic fibrosis. But it shares more with the genetic transmission of disease than it does with the kind of serendipitous transmission of cancer. Um, so now we have parents who, in disclosing a diagnosis to their child, must, in their minds, talk about their role in that diagnosis and in their agency. They also have learned about this diagnosis in varying ways in their own lives, and much of it has been very painful and has caused them stigmatization and difficult times in their families and in their communities. And they start from that perspective, and they wish to protect their child from those feelings that they had in their own lives. And they wish to protect themselves from the feelings they will have in facing their child. And I think we need to start there and recognize those very valid, difficult concerns. And this psychologist, Lipsum, helps the families to deal with this. And then he asks the question, what do I say when the child says, am I going to die? This is not new in the disclosure world, but it needs to be thought about prospectively. And then he unpacks the consequences. And he finally argues that this concept of participation in a dialogue, in a process, not in a moment, 
And he makes the case that the health professionals should be part of the disclosure for those families who are reluctant to disclose or who have difficulty in disclosing so that the health professionals can do this collegially with the families in order to help the families deal with this difficult process. So the AAP comes out with a, with a recommendation and it's still valid and it's still I think the recommendation of the organization still published today. Um, and it basically says that you need to do this based on developmental capacity of the child, the stage of the child, the clinical status of the child. The sicker the child is, the more obligation one has to reveal the spe specificity so the child can deal with his illness. The older the child is, or the consequences to third parties that might come from an infectiously acquired disease for a third party, um, those things matter. Um, and then what are the consequences of telling need to be assessed? The AAP recommends for younger children discuss the illness in terms of immediate needs, that the specific name of the illness is less important than the implications to the child's behavior and health and what he's going to need to do to be compliant with his health regimen, and um, to be sure to elicit and address questions and fears in an open conversation with child and family involve the parents in the disclosure and the AAP says adolescents should, not must, but should be told and you need to deal with that with the families. In this decade some very interesting things happen. Um, we have additional evidence about the negative impact of non-disclosure on children from the developmental psychology literature. We champion fa family-centered care in children's hospitals across the country. We champion it and that argues that we respect parents as integral to the process of making decisions about their children, for their children, and with their children. So we create some conflicts here. And we have a distinction between the clinical and the research context in the disclosure. Um, in this century, we conclude disclosure is recommended in the interests of children, that children are better off when they know. And we have evidence about that. But disclosure is a process and should involve parents and should take into account these other issues. A 2007 article about disclosure and child psychosocial functioning argues that those who are not told internalize problems in a significant manner. More, there's more self-reported distress, more symptoms of depression, and poorer adjustment when the children learn the diagnosis and learn they were deceived or not told. So this kind of information helps us in our conversations with families to at least balance their concerns about negative consequences up against other concerns about negative consequences for their child so that together we're trying to have an alliance or an allegiance in order to uh, be sure that they understand the consequences of non-disclosure as we respect their view about disclosure. And we go on to learn that conspiracies of silence are generally harmful. <clears throat> They're harmful in multiple ways. Um, as an intern, when I went in to see that 14-year-old girl and I had been told not to tell her, maybe I wouldn't have gone in, except I had to draw the blood, maybe I wouldn't have gone in to talk with her that morning because I would have been worried that I couldn't maintain this conspiracy of silence. And in fact, there are data to support that nurses and doctors see patients less often when families ask for a conspiracy of silence in the hospital because they're worried about disclosures that might be inadvertent. The fantasies of the children may be worse than the realities. This is something that I think is true of all children in all circumstances, that dealing with things like funerals of loved ones, children's fantasies about these things are often greater than experiencing the reality in a supportive environment. <clears throat> and I think we need to accept that, that children can cope if they're feeling secure. And that means that we don't deceive them 
and that we share information and we answer their questions and we titrate our answers appropriately. And that non-disclosure increases distrust in a global sense of parents and professionals. And if you didn't tell me I had this really serious diagnosis, can I really trust when you tell me I'm doing OK? And how will I know when you're doing it again? That is to say, not telling me something. And then the most important thing is the children know. And they're protecting us. Because if we're not telling them, it must really be bad. So they're not going to tell us they know. And there's a lot of information. And everyone's got their anecdote about the children knowing, the children protecting their parents, and telling us, particularly 12 or 14 year olds, saying, oh, sure. I knew they didn't want me to know. And I knew that they were all upset. So you know, I just didn't talk about it. The children know. When we were developing this case, I asked Dr. Melvin and Dr. Wilfund, where does this kid get his care? What do you call the clinic? You think there's nobody there who's ever said the word AIDS, or positive, or HIV? Um, well, you know, maybe you, I haven't seen your clinic yet, or your ambulatory care program. <clears throat> but every time I've taken my child or grandchild to the doctor, there's other kids sitting around. Um, it's not like you get in er in four minutes and you get cared for and go home. Um, so, you know, there's lots of indications for children that they're special, that they're coming to this program for a reason, and they're smart. So I think we need to help families understand that while we respect family-centered care, while we believe that families play an incredibly important role in their children's lives, and we need to respect their views and values. So then, all right, minute on assent in research. So read the federal regulations about assent. Nowhere in those regulations does it say we must tell the child the name of his disease as we explain the research study and how, from his perspective, he will be affected. That's the concept of assent. It's the concept of respect for children and informing them of how they will be affected by this research process and getting their affirmative agreement to participate. We don't even require their signature. Now, your IRB may require a signature. I don't recommend it, but the regulations don't require it. They don't require the name of the diagnosis. Assent forms are not consent light. Assent forms do not need to, to have all of the eight essentials of informed consent that the federal regulations require for adults or older adolescents. Assent forms are from the child's perspective, and they are approved by your IRB, consistent with how the child will experience the research, and the child knowing this is voluntary, and knowing they need to affirmatively agree to participate. So in the 1980s in the Bronx, when our IRB was dealing with lots of HIV trials, lots of questions from families about disclosure, we very rapidly came to the conclusion that if the child had not had the name of the disease disclosed, this research context shouldn't be the way that the disclosure occurs. It should be in the clinical context, and it should be in a process in which the child basically is allowed to understand his disease. And child assent does not require disclosing the name of the diagnosis, but merely the context um, of the illness. So, I want to conclude about how do you disclose? This is not an easy issue. This is an issue of art. It's an issue of communication skills. It's using all that we know as pediatricians, all that we know about developmental psychology and interaction with families. We start with the parents. We start by validating their values and their concerns, making sure they understand that we understand how they feel, and validating that those feelings and concerns are real and important. And then we begin to explore how far those concerns bring them. 
Do they have a belief system, as some cultures, some religions in our communities have, that telling itself is a hurtful thing because it will make the thing happen? There are Native American cultures in our country who believe that if you tell someone they have a disease that might be fatal, you will force the disease to be fatal. You will cause the death of the patient. We need to understand that if that's the belief system of people because that's a much more fundamental conversation that's more difficult because it's in a religious or cultural context. <clears throat> Explore the parents' greatest fears. Help them help you and then share with them fears that other parents have shared with you, which are probably their fears as well. And do that as a psychological communications interaction in order to make sure that parents understand where you're coming from, and that is that you believe we should disclose this in the child's interests, just as they believe we should not in the child's interests, and help them weigh the consequences of the telling and how you can help them with those consequences and the not telling and how you can't help them to, to undo those consequences unless we tell. And then develop a trajectory. Develop a trajectory of incremental disclosure. And as the child reaches 12, we as pediatricians come to a point where at 14 or 16 or somewhere along the line, a third party may be impacted by that child's not understanding his diagnosis and how he can impact on others. So we as pediatricians then up the ante as children get older. And we may at some point in time say to a family, and I think this is really the end game, not the middle game, we may say we will and we must disclose for the sake of the child and others and we will disclose at this time in three months from now, in six months from now, and how can we best do that over this period of time and maintain our respect for you but our obligations to your child. And that kind of allegiance with the family but based in a kind of um, time trajectory I think is the end game if one gets pushed to the wall. Really, clinicians who've done this a lot rarely get pushed to that wall. It's a very unusual event where families can't be walked through taking the time as we've outlined it. So is there an ethical obligation to inform children with a serious disease about their diagnoses? Dr. Melvin's first question. Yes, but. Um, and we've talked about the distinctions here and the social implications of the diagnosis and how to involve the families. What role should family wishes, social context, and cultural beliefs play in this disclosure? A large role. It would be inappropriate for us to ignore that important part of this disclosure. And in the research context, I think that's a bogus argument. And I'd be happy to talk to an IRB that believes that informing someone of the name of their diagnosis is critical to respecting their role in making decisions about whether they want to participate as a child in research. Um, and I think IRBs have come long past that uh, in the Children's Hospitals of America. Um, so I thank you. I've done this longer than I was supposed to. Um, and we're supposed to have a dialogue of comments and questions, harangues, criticisms. Dr. Melvin can come back and help us talk about this issue. Um, and I open the floor. And we have to ask you to come to the microphones and tell me who you are when you ask the question. Please. Professor Wilfund has a question. I think I got it. OK. OK, he's got it. So I want to um, ask you to consider a different perspective on the research question. You pointed out that, that, uh, that the name of the, the disease may not be necessary for assent. But there might be another reason why we might want to be reluctant to in involve children in research who don't know the name of the disease. Because to the extent that we want, we want to respect the parents' wishes, in the clinical context, we can potentially control who knows about the patient, what they know about them. But as we increase the number of activities that are going on, 
increased number of people who are involved in their care, which might increase with research, we actually might expose the child and the family to a greater risk of inadvertent disclosure in that context. And might that be a reason to uh, potentially discourage parents from enrolling their children in research studies because of that risk? I think that's a good question, Ben. I wouldn't discourage the families. I would inform them of your concern. And in informing them of the <laughs> sorry, Greg. In, in, uh, in informing them of your concern, they can not consent for their child to be in the research. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's totally voluntary for their child. But interestingly, most families want their children in potentially beneficial research. In fact, we learned that most families wanted their children even in research that did not have the prospect of direct benefit um, because they really were, uh, had good alliances with clinicians cared a lot about the disease, understood that more you learned about this disease, the better off future children would be. So I think you can inform the parents, and then they can decide. Um, but I'm not too worried about inner, inner, inadvertent, because the research context, I think you really do have people who are primarily interested in this disease. The children aren't admitted on a general ward. They're interested in this disease. They come to a special program. Uh, and I think the research assistants and the docs who do this can, can deal with that. So I'm not too worried about it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name's Lisa Frankel, and I've worked with kids with HIV since the mid-'80s, and I agree with everything you've said. And I think that one thing I've learned over the um, last 25 years is that if you start out from when you first introduce or introduce to the kid and talk about each step you're going along, like we're trying to figure out what's going on with you, There's a, these are the uncertainties, and talk about everything as you go along and respect the parents' idea, uh, wishes not to inform them directly of the stated diagnosis, but let them know that you need to talk to them about their illness, that most of the time it works really well. And that with kids, with HIV especially, if they're uh, come to medical attention early in life that it's much easier because often they come at a time where they've never heard the word AIDS or HIV and so it's not an, an issue for them but they understand that there's maybe something wrong with their blood and that you're working to help make them better and, and now when we get I mean there was a time where we'd get kids 10 years old who were perinatally infected and those were the most difficult. Right, right. And of course we use the language of there are some children who can't fight infections as well as others. And you can get into lots of the, the issues relative to ascent based in, you know, in those issues. Yes. Hi, my name is Chuck Cowan. I'm a developmental pediatrician. I take care of a lot of children with autism. So I was very interested that, that autism and schizophrenia were up on your list, which is I think somewhat of a dif different paradigm because we're not dealing with fatal disorders. But we are dealing as clinicians with some degree of inability to understand what the child knows because of their difficulties with communication or thought disorders. So how, how would you, what are your thoughts about uh, revealing or talking or using those terminology in people whose ways of thinking we don't understand, which is somewhat different than right. how we understand typical children right. think? Well, thank you for raising that question. And I, I think I was the person who put those diagnoses on that slide, didn't I? Yeah. Um, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just you know, a Freudian uh, slip here. I think that's really a very interesting dilemma when we deal with children with mental illness issues that actually can be exacerbating uh, situations as children nowadays go and learn about the names of things. Autism, as we all know, is a broad category. Um, we even call it a spectrum. Um, so that it, it can uh, enhance fears in the children, um, particularly those with less intense symptomatology. And similarly, I think we have a whole problem in this society of not understanding mental illness, specifically schizophrenia um, and psychotic uh, episodes. Um, and I think some of that is best served with titrating the, the um, symptoms and discussions rather than placing a name on that diagnosis. I'm uh, quite um, comfortable with children uh, knowing at their own level 
how much they need to know and titrating that through as they get older. Um, you know, I think that that's a very good question. Yes? Yeah, I think, I think the dilemma is a challenge. Is you think the dilemma? The, I think the dilemma is, is truly understanding what their level is, right. particularly with people that have communication problems. Right. So I, I think we have a tendency to assume that they can't understand um, because they can't tell us that they understand. Um, and in, in many ways, I, I agree that I think that we potentially increase anxiety by refusing or being unable to explain these problems at the level that we guess the child can understand. So I think there still needs to be a lot of work in this Absolutely. area to help, under, help and us. I'm glad you're there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is David Fisher. I'm the medical director. Um, your presentation made me think about disclosure of adverse events to children. And so I'd give us your thoughts on that. Particularly, I like the way you use the developmental construct. Well, adverse events, which I got to tell the interns, do happen. Um, and they're sometimes, sometimes, because we actually make a mistake. Uh, most of the time, they're because they're events that happen um, without a mistake. And when I was an intern, I was told, if you make a mistake, you might want to tell the attending, but you certainly wouldn't tell the family. We've learned from then that that's both foolish and unethical. Um, the question is, how do you deal with disclosing errors to children? Uh, I think that's in collaboration with families. And the devil's in the details. So if the error actually caused the child to suffer rather than just, you know, was an adverse event but the child has, you know, recovered fully, um, then I think we have some obligations to the child on this developmental trajectory. Because if we want her to continue to trust us, then it's the same argument in terms of how we deal with our adult patients. The, the relationship of trust between doctor and child is critical, just as it is in all relationships between doctors and patients. So I would titrate that information as best I could um, with appropriate uh, admitting that sometimes there are these kinds of problems. Um, I think that makes sense in the children's hospital construct, um, but it's all in the, the, in the details. And I think the most important thing is that we reveal it among the professional staff, we elevate it to a discussion at the medical director level, we bring in the nursing professionals and we decide how to best disclose this information to families in a coherent and consistent manner, and then we engage the children at their developmental trajectory. So I didn't answer your question, but I think it's an important thing to you, for you to worry about. <laughs> Is that okay? My point was to get everybody in the room thinking about that. Right. Because I can't say I have thought about that that much. Right in my career as an intensivist, and I, maybe I should have, the room will know what to, what to do as they think about it. Thank you. So, Alan, I had a question from the global health um, context. Um, not just for HIV, but certainly largely for HIV right now. Um, a lot of the children in orphanages, you mentioned the conspiracy of silence. You know, they don't know their diagnoses, or they know it, but they haven't been told. And so I wonder if you have strategies for those of us who work with kids on their own who don't have that family support system or even a temporary family support system to help cope with the diagnosis, do you think it falls on the shoulders of the investigators or residents or global health physicians who are working in these areas to disclose compassionately over time? And how do you suggest we deal with the challenges of, of doing that in yes. that context? Thank you, Maureen, for that hour and a half question. Um, <clears throat> there are two things, ethical imperialism a term that Professor Wilfon and I know well. Um, it's the taking our ethical constructs and exporting them to other communities and countries and parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> we've done that in many aspects of US life in the last decade. Um, and in this aspect of US life, uh, we can be more thoughtful. Um, we need to understand how those communities 
think about these problems. So that's the first thing. So before you answer the question, you need to have been part of that community and understand that community's mores. The other thing that happens to those of us who do international work is we tend to do parachute jumps, even if we stay for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month. And then we go home, whether it's to Seattle or Washington or Baltimore or wherever. And that, I think, creates some thought, more thoughtfulness in me that it shouldn't be me doing that disclosing. It's got to be in the context of caregivers around the child. So this is really a process in which the investigator brings her values to the community, helps the community with their values, brings the insights about child development, brings the insights about the importance of disclosure, and tries to create within that environment a community that will support the kids and disclose the diagnoses. But I think part of the problem, and I guess um, it's more common in how um, younger people, in my, you know, that's what happens when you get old. It's more common that younger people see their obligations in a more discreet manner. That is to say, I've got to get this done. It's got to be checked off because it's in the interests of the child. I think we need to be more um, thoughtful about, you want to argue with that? No, I wanted to say that I think that you should tell them exactly what you're doing directly that moment. Like, I'm Drawing taking blood. a sample of your blood, right. and I'm happy to answer any questions. That's, that's at sure. least my belief. Absolutely. And then answer them honestly, but very directly, and not with a lot of explanation, and just see if they want more explanation. Right. I'm, I agree with you completely. Um, I think Maureen's question is much deeper than that. I mean, yours is where we start from respect for children so they understand why we're here and what we're doing. And then we titrate our answers based on their inquisitiveness. But I think Maureen's really going a step further than that and saying, you know, we're in this program. We've got 35 kids in the orphanage. We're, draw you know, we're doing these studies. What's our obligation about changing the norm, which is don't tell, but the kids know? And I think that's a, uh, that's, I think, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to stop a moment. Okay, yes. Sure. Hi, I'm Russ Geyer. I'm one of the oncologists here. And my question really is, in retrospect, what would you have told now that 14-year-old girl with leukemia? And the question really is, at, at what point? At what point? Do you, no, not at what point, but, <clears throat> but, but at what point do our ethical obligations to honesty with our patients our, our actual patients right. as opposed to their parents supersede the com I completely agree with the developmental process but right. but what and and is there a role for if you will some degree of a contract with the family early the parents early on and saying I cannot go beyond this if the child asks me to, do I have leukemia I cannot lie I mean what right. how do you how do you handle that yeah I, I think every child today should be disclosed their diagnosis of leukemia in an appropriate manner at the appropriate time and I think that is a collaboration between parents and clinicians. I mean, when you sit down with a family, you know, 36 hours after you've made the diagnosis and done all of the appropriate testing, and you're about to enroll that family in a clinical trajectory, which is usually a clinical trial, um, when you sit down with that family, that conversation, which has been well studied by Rick Kodish and others, um, is an incredibly powerful moment in that family's life. And part of that time has to be, and how are we going to deal with talking with Johnny? Um, and I think that every oncologist today deals with that. And there is a trajectory. But I would caution you to not create the contract too early. That is to say, I would caution you to not make it sound like, and I know you didn't, not make it sound like it's adversarial. Um, but make it sound like we together have a very important journey we're going on. And we need to make sure that Johnny is best cared for. And part of that is engaging him in his care and in his disease. And this is how I've done it with other families. Uh, families come with these concerns. And how can we help Johnny? 
um, because I think that's where families come from, wanting to help Johnny. Um, their perception may be different than yours, and it's not important to tell Johnny his diagnosis at 36 hours if they don't think it's important. Now, when Johnny is 14 or 16 or even 12, he's going to know. He's also going to know when he starts to get into all these treatments and meet other kids on the unit or in the clinic. So um, I think the time frame is fairly narrow. Um, but I, I wouldn't call it a contract. I'd call it an alliance, a collaboration. We're in this together. We're going to take a journey together for a lot of years. And we're just beginning. And, this is, and that's why it's so important for us to be in sync. And that, you know, I, I know that's what you do. Um, but I would be careful to engage it in that way. Last comment from Dr. Melvin. And it's a, a, an obvious comment, except that I think one of the things that does also make HIV different than cancer is that the children are well and feel well. So the parents often think of the disclosure as an even though we think of it as a process, and maybe the pre-disclosure they think of as a process, they think of the process, the disclosure, as the end. And one of the things I found is that then they're done. They've told it, and they don't talk about it at home. And the kid doesn't talk about it at home, because obviously the parents don't want to talk about it at home. So there's that post-process, and that's just a, a yeah. important for people to understand that, that, that there has to be, again, that continued openness to allow the child to ask the questions, and that there's that post-process of continued discussion. because. In cancer, I think it's easier because they're sick and their things are happening and that happens. And kids that otherwise feel well, it's not an, an end point. It's a Thank you. That's really very helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Would everyone please join me in thanking Dr. Melvin, Dr. Fleshman. See you next time. Thanks.